Hello and welcome to the first ever brand new Football Made Simple podcast. Or should I say mini podcast, seeing as it's not that long. Thank you to everyone who voted in the polls. And it seems most of you wanted a podcast, so here it is. So just a couple of things before we get into the main section of the podcast, seeing as this is our first ever episode. As always, Football Made Simple remains community focused, meaning that the videos that you suggest are the ones that get made. So always feel free to drop suggestions in the comments. And if you disagree with anything I say or want to add anything, just drop it in the comments and we can have a discussion. So going forward, every week before the podcast, in a community post on YouTube as well as on Twitter, I'll post what the main topic of the podcast will be about. This will give you time to leave comments on what you'd want to see covered and your opinions on the matter. And at the end of the podcast, we have a segment called Your Say, where I'll go over some of your opinions. So this podcast will be slightly less formal, allowing us to go in-depth on different topics. There will be fewer animations than the regular videos, which will save time and allow me to get more of these mini-podcasts out to you. However, when there is an animation, I'll just let you know that it's on screen so you can have a look. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's get into the main part of the podcast. So, the final is over and it ended 4-1 to Chelsea. And like I said in the main video, the scoreline may be a little bit flattering to Chelsea. And depending on where you look, the XG was 1.5 to 1.5. But my source says it was 1.85 to Chelsea and 1.73 to Arsenal. But that's also a credit to how clinical Chelsea were. Giroud and Pedro were especially clinical with their chances. And for Arsenal, they saw many decent chances missed. Lacazette had to score with his 41% chance and Willock missed a 37% chance, although I don't want to be too harsh on the youngster. But let's discuss each team in detail, what they did well and what they didn't, although there'll be some overlap between the points. Okay, we'll start with Arsenal. They got into dangerous positions many many times in this match, mainly through the fullbacks. Kolasinac especially was basically playing as a left winger at points. In fact, he was one of their best attacking players on the day, and I'll throw up a graphic with some of his key stats. On the day, he had the third most key passes for Arsenal, fourth most touches, fourth most passes and more. A brief animation is on screen now recapping how he got into these positions. First of all, Aubameyang and Lacazette would shift out to their right hand side and be joined by the Arsenal midfield. Maitland Niles would advance up the pitch as well and he was a major threat for Arsenal as well, completing the most dribbles as well as the second most crosses for the team. So Chelsea had to be wary of his threat as well, which led to the whole team shifting across to their left hand side. The ball would then be passed to Xhaka, who completed 12 accurate long balls throughout the match. He would often switch the ball to Kolasinac, which would find him 1 vs 1 against Aspilicueta. This led to a lot of dangerous scenarios. One moment in particular, Kolasinac got into the box and he took a touch instead of crossing it first time. This allowed Aspilicueta to just about get back in time and make the block. This was a theme with Kolasinac throughout the match. Although he got into these dangerous positions, he often hesitated with his crosses, meaning that he actually only had two crosses throughout the match, despite getting in all these good positions. Kolasinac was a great outlet for Arsenal, although here's where I think there are things both managers could have done better and where they may have gone wrong. First of all, I think Sarri and his men overcompensated when shifting across to the left. A graphic is up on screen now. They were very wary of keeping tabs on Lacazette and Aubameyang, such that their shape would become too narrow, leaving massive gaps on their right-hand side, which Kolasinac took advantage of. Could this have been a deliberate tactic by Sarri? Maybe. Maybe he had the confidence that Aspilicueta could tuck in as well as get out to Kolasinac when the ball was switched. But some of Aspilicueta's blocks seemed very last-minute at times. But here's where I really, really think Arsenal missed a trick. See, one of the biggest things you can do in football is create a numerical overload. So for example, graphic on screen now, when City play, when they have the opposition pinned back, their centre-backs drift really high up the pitch to increase numbers and create an overload in midfield. In fact, you often see Laporte in the left half space playing as high as most teams might play an attacking midfielder. So how does this relate to Arsenal? Well, as you can see on the graphic on screen now, in scenarios where they had control, it would have been interesting to see Monreal move up the pitch to create a 2 versus one against Aspilicueta. In this situation, it would have forced Chelsea to leave a midfielder wide to cover Monreal, potentially providing space for one of the Arsenal midfield to take advantage of, or a 2 vs 1 situation where Aspilicueta wouldn't be able to block the cross. To be fair to Sarri, he often kept his wingers high and wide, even when they were on the defensive, so as a result Monreal would want to stay back to prevent a 3 vs 3. And here's where we come to a concept of the disadvantages of not having top level ball playing centre backs or a ball playing goalkeeper. And let me elaborate on this. So top ball playing teams like Barcelona have PK, Bayern have Hummels and Van Dijk at Liverpool is another example. Where they would be confident enough in that situation to go higher because they know when they get the ball, they'll keep it. 
so the man left behind them won't matter as they won't directly concede a counterattack. So when playing the back three especially, graphic on screen now, you'd want at least one of your wide centre backs to be comfortable on the ball, because it would mean Xhaka could have stayed in midfield and maintained a 3 vs 3 in the centre of midfield. But now, when Xhaka has to create play from deep, it's drawing pressure into your own defensive half, and without a ball playing keeper, they immediately went long from Czech. Which is credit to Sari, because this is exactly what he planned. Because you can see, he always maintained his numbers to deal with the aerial threat. But if Arsenal had had a ball playing goalkeeper, an Edison, Ter Stegen or Neuer, graphic on screen now, it would mean if Chelsea wanted to press, they'll need to commit 5 players if Xhaka stayed back. So let's say Giroud presses the keeper, and if Chelsea wants a high press, it would mean Kovacic and Kante would have to join the press. And all of a sudden, Jorginho has a 2 vs 1 against him in Ozil and Torreira, and a clip pass into midfield would take 5 Chelsea players out of the game. Or, if Chelsea chose not to press, the ball playing goalkeeper would find a pass to get them out of danger. Because as we know, Sarri wanted at least 3 men on Arsenal's 2 forwards for the long pass. So a ball playing centre back would mean that Xhaka wouldn't have to drop into defence. And this would create a 3 vs 2 in favour of Arsenal in the midfield. Ok I'm looking at my bullet point list of what I wanted to cover, and there's a lot I want to cover, but this is the first episode so it has to be relatively short so I can assess whether many of you are interested. So if you enjoyed this style of video, drop a comment below and if you don't mind longer more detailed episodes in the future, let me know in the comments as well. Ok, so now we'll move on to Chelsea. And first of all, we have to credit Sarri for being willing to make adaptations. Emery stuck to his 5-3-2 in defence, graphic on screen now, which meant that Hazard would drift slightly central and Emerson would overlap creating a 2 vs 1. Emery could have instructed his team to attack with two forwards central, but when defending, Aubameyang could have dropped to the right wing, which he's done many times, and defending in this 5-4-1 would have stopped the overload. So the natural advantage of the 5-3-2 versus the 4-3-3 is creating 1 versus 1s against the centre backs as shown by the graphic. Sarri adapted to this by instructing his team that without the ball, they would press Arsenal high, which would force them long, and at the same time he kept 3-4 players around the two forwards, meaning that they could defend the flick on. And with the ball, he decided that they'll defend with the back three, to keep the extra man back. So during the match, no matter what happened, only one full back went up at a time, which allowed them to maintain a 3 vs 2 in defence. The other adaptation was wanting to keep his three forwards high up the pitch. Under severe pressure they dropped into a 4-1-4-1, but often he kept a 4-3-3 in defence. I think this may have been an attempt to pin Arsenal's full backs back, as they would worry about tracking Chelsea's forwards so that they don't create a 3 vs 3 against the centre backs. Or that if the fullbacks did advance, it left 1v1s at the back against Arsenal's defenders. This tactic I would say was less successful, because this is what led to Maitland-Niles and Kolasinac running riot, but at least it was a show of some adaptability. But I want to come to a key player and a key tactic for Sarri. Yes, we know Azard was the man of the match, but Mateo Kovacic was fantastic. Sarri knew Emre would use the common tactic of man-marking Jorginho, with Ozil in this case, so it was up to Kovacic to find intelligent spaces and be the ball-progressing midfielder. As we discussed in the main video, he did this through dropping deep. There's a graphic on screen now. Kante stayed high-ish on the right side, and Jorginho was marked by Ozil, and Aubameyang and Lacazette stayed on the centre-backs. So through this move into this zone, it asked Arsenal a question, whether Torreira would come with Kovacic. Sarri kept all three forwards high, so if Torreira did come, it freed up a pass into the forwards, albeit with their back to goal. But if Torreira stayed back as a shield, there was a 3 vs 1 to progress the ball on the left hand side. Kovacic really stepped up his game in this match, especially when building up from deep. He had the most passes for Chelsea, second most dribbles, second highest pass accuracy and the third most touches. And to top it all off, he made their fourth most tackles. An all action performance in every sense of the word. But I want to keep this first episode short, so drop a like or a comment below if you don't mind longer videos. And if you haven't, subscribe and maybe even share this video. Let's move on to the last segment, which is your take. Again, we're community focused, so I always want to hear your take. A good way is to tweet whatever you want included in the podcast to at FootballMateSim or leave a comment below on the previous video. So for example, the following comments are from the Europa League Tactical Review, and those comments are then covered in the Europa League podcast. Ok, Awais Kasim says, Address Arsenal's defensive inaptitude, especially if Chelsea's XG was only 1.8. Thanks a lot for your comment Awais. Defensive inaptitude. Well, conceding 4 from such a low XG usually means one of two things. The goalkeeper has made a huge error and conceded an easy shot, or the opposition has finished extremely well. And in this case I think it's the latter. Giroud and Pedro scored from two shots whose combined XG was only 12%. 
But yes, the penalty was terrible to give away, and what it highlighted is how badly Arsenal lost their shape after conceding. They went too gung-ho with both the fullbacks and the midfield advancing far too high. And this left massive gaps, which meant Maitland-Niles was out of position. I would say this XG shows how bad Arsenal were at finishing rather than defending. It won't be scored from a 4% chance, but Lacazette missed a 41% chance, a 14% chance, and Willock missed a 37% one. So if Arsenal had their shooting boots on, it could have been a very different story. Okay, last one for today. Liverpool fan 111 says, graphic on screen now, Arsenal used a tactic where Maitland-Niles played 1-2s to the inside left channel between Emerson and Louise, which pulled Louise out of position and led to a cross. And this is a great observation which I encourage. It's very true and maybe a reason why Chelsea overcommitted to the left-hand side is that they were picking up not only Aubameyang and Lacazette, but Maitland-Niles as well. So the whole back four had to shift to maintain a 4 versus 3. Great observation, mate. Right, I think that's enough for today, so please, please leave a comment below of what you thought. Let me know what I should improve, what segments to add going forward, and do you want to see me go more in-depth on a video I've done already, or do you have any new idea? Either way, leave it below. That's all for today, and remember, keep it simple.